The first thing that strikes one as odd when looking at the history of marijuana, which is also known as cannabis, is how very much legal it once was. In fact, it wasn't only legal, it just happened to be one of the largest agricultural crops in the world, including the United States. You see, cannabis can also be hemp. And just what is hemp? Well, it's by and large the most robust, durable, natural soft fiber on the face of this planet. Up until 1883 and for thousands of years before, cannabis hemp was the largest agricultural crop in the world. It had thousands of uses and products. The majority of fabric, lighting oil, medicines, paper and fiber came from hemp. The first marijuana law to exist in the United States was a law ordering farmers to grow hemp. Benjamin Franklin used it to start one of America's first paper mills. The first two copies of the Declaration of Independence were written on cannabis hemp paper. Up until the 1800s, most of the textiles in the United States were made with hemp. 50% of medicine marketed in the last half of the 19th century was made from cannabis. Even Queen Victoria used the resin extracts from cannabis to alleviate her menstrual cramps. But the funny thing about industrial hemp was you couldn't get high from it. Yet, it was lumped in with the following, which also made little sense. Reefer Madness. In the early 20th century, yellow journalism had surfaced. Articles depicted blacks and Mexicans as frenzied beasts who would smoke marijuana, play devil's music, and heap disrespect and viciousness on the readership, a majority of which happened to be white. Some offenses included looking at a white woman twice, laughing at a white person, or even stepping on white men's shadows. And this ended up leading to a law in the form of a tax stamp. A tax stamp that would not only include marijuana, but also hemp and cannabis medicines. It speculated that hemp's potential for an abundance of new products was going to be in direct competition with other sources. And this, added to the reefer madness, led to the eventual downfall of all forms of cannabis. Popular Mechanics magazine had actually prepared an article entitled, New Billion Dollar Crop. Hemp was touted as being able to produce more than 5,000 textile products from its thread-like fiber and more than 25,000 products from its cellulose, ranging from dynamite to cellophane. Its superiority as a source for paper was also becoming known, especially with the development of hemp processing equipment. Now the new marijuana tax act was all fine and dandy, except for one thing. If you wanted to grow hemp, you needed to buy a stamp, but they weren't giving any out to anybody. And so, in effect, all forms of cannabis became illegal. Things pretty much stayed that way until World War II, when the government decided that hemp once again was a good thing and produced a video, Hemp for Victory. But by the time the war was over, hemp again became bad. And in 1948, when the marijuana law once again came into question, Congress recognized that marijuana was made illegal for the wrong reason. It didn't make people violent at all. It made them pacifists. The communists would use it to weaken America's will to fight. Congress now voted to keep marijuana illegal for the exact opposite reason they had outlawed it in the first place. And all through the years, report after report, commissioned by everybody, from the mayor of New York to the president of the United States, has come back with the view that marijuana should have no criminal penalty attached to it. Yet, marijuana remains as illegal today as it did nearly 70 years ago. One. The prohibition hasn't reduced the demand, and it certainly hasn't reduced the supply. Two, it's a steady source of revenue for organized crime, which in turn attracts young people because the money is so easy. And three, being an underground market actually creates crime and violence. And yet, the only one paying the costs for all of this are the taxpayers, people like you and me. Even further, this whole deal is over a drug that seems to pose no more of a threat than the substances we already regulate. At the very least, why isn't this up for debate? Dwight Eisenhower once spoke of a military-industrial complex. Have we built up a marijuana prohibition complex? The real war on marijuana didn't start until 1972. And President Nixon said, you know, it's all the Jews smoking pot. And I mean, he really said that. When Nixon got into this with his war on drugs, he had a things that he wanted to do. He had an agenda. A lot of the information that was kept and warehoused in the Library of Congress and also at major universities was actually recalled and destroyed. The Nixon report that came out through his administration was called the Schaefer Report. It was by a Republican governor and when he studied it and gave an answer, you can pick this report up, pick up any page, open it, and if you actually have experience with cannabis, you'll realize they're telling the truth.
And then when it came back saying that marijuana was essentially harmless, he totally ignored it, said we're going to launch a war on drugs anyways. He didn't even print as many copies that Congress and the House would have been able to see. 1970, beginning of the war on drugs, 76 New Jersey troopers became detectives. I was one of them. They designated one-third of us undercover. I happen to fall in that one-third. That's where I spent the next 14 years of my life. What we were targeted on was the pot smokers. There was a very good reason we were targeted on pot smokers. Most of them were protesting against the Vietnam War. Now, if you could arrest that whole group of people because they were smoking pot, you didn't have to have a Vietnam War protest, which Mr. Nixon thought was a pretty good idea. So when President Nixon declared the civil war that we're living in right now, the drug war, in 1972, it was really a war on marijuana. It really didn't kick in until the 80s when Reagan you know, took over um, his presidency of the U.S. Ronald Reagan, he said, these young people, they get together, they read books, they smoke marijuana, and they talk. Like these three elements were a recipe for disaster. How do I feel about legalizing marijuana? Am I for it or against it? I am totally against legalizing marijuana. And make no mistake, the U.S. government, the focus of their war on drugs is cannabis. Uh, the focus of their rhetoric is cannabis. It's certainly used as a, a poster child for all drugs. When you see an ad for drugs, it's always the marijuana leaf that goes up. It's almost like a religious jihad, more powerful than going for the gusto causes people to think. When people think, they question. They question things like, say, the war in Vietnam, or race separation of blacks and whites like they did in the 30s in the jazz clubs, or women's rights, or the Gulf War, oil wars. It's real simple. You put your loafers on, you put your black socks on, you get in your car, you have your briefcase, you say hi to your neighbors, he mows his lawn just like you do, and things keep moving along in the same direction they always have been. That's why marijuana laws exist. There are, in my opinion, people in government, at all levels of government, who know that it's not a winnable war, and yet you say hi to your neighbors, he mows his lawn just like you do, and things keep moving along in the same direction they always have been. That's why marijuana laws exist. There are, in my opinion, people in government, at all levels of government, who know that it's not a winnable war, and yet they continue to pursue it. Acceptance of drug use is simply not an option for this administration. Often we go to debates and it's a police officer debating us. Okay, the police are supposed to enforce the laws. They should not be arguing for or against laws. That's not their job. Well, what is their job? Is it to enforce laws that exist on the books or to determine the policy of the laws that are made? The way to justify the policy is to create a lot of fear and then spend a lot of money combating that. Quite frankly, if you took the using population of all the other illegal drugs combined and you eliminated cannabis from that equation, there wouldn't be a big enough drug problem in either this country or the United States to justify the massive expenditures uh, that go towards fighting the war. The amazing thing is the small amount of enforcement that is necessary. $400 million is spent annually in Canada arresting and prosecuting marijuana crimes. The total budget in Canada for all drugs is $500 million. That means four-fifths of the drug budget goes towards arresting and prosecuting marijuana users, leaving one-fifth for crack, heroin, coke, crystal meth, the date rape drug, whatever. The drug enforcement industry is big business. It's self-perpetuating. It relies on taxpayer dollars. And so it's an endless battle that the DEA doesn't win. They participate in. It's like doing a big budget movie, you know. You get $30 million to do a movie, and then the movie comes out and it doesn't make any money. But someone made $30 million. Every once in a while, they'll show a guy, you know, posing beside a big bunch of marijuana, you know, this is the, the DEA money at work. It would be like asking loggers about saving trees, you know what I mean? This is where their, their mainstay of their cash flow comes from. The campaign will continue uh, until every uh, available known uh, plot of marijuana has been eradicated. We've got to live with it, doing the best job we can. Even if it's a bad job, we're all carrying a pretty impossible load, Miss Gibson. 
There are many, many police officers, however, who believe that it ought to be legalized, regulated, and controlled. They see the hypocrisy between our existing laws relating to alcohol and marijuana in their day-to-day -day life, shift after shift after shift, and they get it. But they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose that promotion to sergeant or the assignment to detectives. They want to be a chief someday, and they don't want to piss off the people in power. Judges, lawyers, prosecutors, defense lawyers, uh, prison guards, uh, there's all of those people in the criminal justice industry. Are their interests being protected? Well, in a sense, yes, they are. Defense bar, similarly, we make money. The more things they prohibit, the more money we make. Sorry I'm late, Kent. I was delayed in court. You still have large numbers of people being busted for simple possession. If you look at the stats, in terms of drug offenses, the largest group are still simple possession of marijuana.